The uh, second presentation this evening features the work of Niraj Bhatia, an architect and urban designer who founded uh, the Open Workshop in San Francisco in 2011. His work includes design projects as well as writing and editing. In addition to his practice, he is an assistant professor of architecture at the California College of the Arts, where he is currently the co-chair of the Urban Works Agency, a group within CCA taking on urbanistic issues such as San Francisco's housing crisis through projects, exhibitions, public events, and publications. Niraj holds a Master of Architecture and Urban Design degree from MIT and both a Bachelor of Architecture and a Bachelor of, Ar of Environmental Studies degree from the University of Waterloo. In his submission, he presented, quote, projects that examine how the human and environmental subjects and their individual transforming, ephemeral, and often contradictory characteristics continuously recompose a permanent work. He describes his architecture as a kind of collective framework that foregrounds the richness of a dynamic subject. We welcome Niraj. So thank you, Gerald, for the introduction. And uh, thank you to Anne and Matt for organizing everything this week. I know there was a lot of uh, choreography and you guys have been doing the last few months, so thank you. And uh, thank you to Jonathan Massey, who I'm very happy is here today, and his support, as well as CCA support, uh, for uh, everything my office has been doing. Um, I also want to thank uh, some amazing people I've had, uh, been very fortunate to work with in these past years in San Francisco, including Cesar Lopez, uh, Sean Comlos, uh, Jeremy Jacinth, Haifa El Guaz, uh, Bella Mang, as well as Blake Stevenson. Um, I'm just going to adjust this up a bit. It is a little awkward. You're right. <laughs> um, let, me, let me start by saying that I think today architecture is having a disciplinary identity crisis. Um, I think the discipline traditionally has really done really well uh, with thinking through uh, determinancy, permanence, and form, with the role of the architect being to determine these lines that order the natural and social world. And this disciplinary need to control uh, neglects, for the most part, the evolving and transforming qualities of the natural environment. And today we are much more aware of the futility in attempting to control the natural environment, requiring architecture to engage in transformation, adaptation, and ultimately time. At the same time, with the rise and embrace of pluralism and the diversity that pluralism brings being the core of the public sphere, we see that the subject of design is also expanding no longer the masses, architecture is confronted with divergent subjects and their individual values that are often irreconcilable or controllable. So how do these divergent, transforming, and impermanent variables in our natural and political world interface with architecture? And this becomes a question of where design and designers should exert control and where it can allow for choice, flexibility, and transformation. And, and this tension uh, is not new. I think uh, it emerged probably between the Enlightenment and Romanticism and more forcefully in the 1960s, um, where several different approaches of looking at where to exert control or lack thereof, you know, ant farm being sort of on one end of the spectrum where very little control was exerted. So uh, my office is dedicated to situating design at the edge of this tension the edge between determinancy and indeterminacy, form and atmosphere, permanence and impermanence. We are very influenced by the possibilities presented by the theoretical construct posited by Umberto Eco in 1962, entitled The Open Work, which positions the designer as a form of choreographer. Eco, uh, for those of you who haven't had the chance to read uh, his treaties, um, he characterizes various works of art particularly poetry, film, and music, as either closed or open, depending on the relationship crafted between the subject, which is the viewer of the piece, the object, the work of art, and the author, the artist. For Echo, the closed conception was one where the artwork uh, was interpreted by the subject exactly how the artist wanted them to see it in a singular manner. In contrast to the closed work, Echo speaks of the emergence of the open work, a work that has been strategically designed by the author to have a degree of openness, allowing each individual subject to project the final missing pieces to complete the work. 
And while the open work allowed for the possibility of numerous personal experiences and interventions, it still maintained its status as a work through being framed within, quote, a world intended by the author. So design determinism or precision was not lost in this equation. From the musical compositions of Stockhausen and Boulez to metaphors of Kafka and puns by Joyce, the open work inserted the subject as an active agent in the production of the work. So Echo uh, doesn't talk about architecture um, in his book, but if, if we were to apply this uh, concept to architecture, landscape architecture, or infrastructural design, the open work would, I contend, require an expansion of the subject to also include the environmental context or site, which is part of every architectural project. The power of Echo's concept is in that it allows for the simultaneity of an underlying order and an openness for indeterminate acts. Therefore, the open work holds much promise for addressing one of the most complex uh, contemporary design issues, political and environmental indeterminacy. So I'm gonna present uh, four approaches today with uh, associated projects to unpack this tension between permanence and impermanence. And I should mention that this list is not uh, scientific, it's post-rationalized as I put the portfolio together. And, and I think also these four themes are just the start. I, I think there's many more uh, to develop over one's career. Um, and also when I present these works, I'm not gonna be presenting them holistically. I'll actually just be zooming in on very specific components of them uh, to illustrate the point. Um, the first category is what I've termed frameworks. These are structures that accommodate and engage indeterminate and evolving subjects. These fluctuating subjects are able to transform, adapt, or occupy these structures in novel ways. And typically operating through a negotiation of a legible geometric primitive and flexible field conditions, these structures are brought to life through framing and indexing in permanent ephemeral subjects. So the project I'll show is one for a very small play structure in Oakland where similar to a food desert, there is a play desert. So uh, this project is called Scaffoldia, um, and we typically think of scaffolding as a temporary element in service of constructing a more permanent structure. And for this project, we really wanted to ask uh, what if scaffolding itself was the primary structure that instead of supporting the construction of permanent artifacts, incited temporal forms of occupation. How can residents take control of structures and reappropriate them to play on top of, within, and inside? So this is a, a play structure that originates from very two very simple monumental archi architectural forms that for us embody an outward space conception and an inward space conception, that of the pyramid and the dome. And hybridizing these forms, the project transforms the poche space into an occupiable lattice. This creates a very simple three-dimensional object that allows for engagement on top of and below and within. So moving between interior and exterior, these shapes allow for different relationships with the human body, whether sitting or climbing or hanging. Uh, we saw a numerous number of things happen um, without prescribing a singular way to interact with the project. So for us as a play structure, what's interesting about play and the whole lineage and history of, of architects that have looked at play and the politics of play is that it's really about curiosity, uh, vulnerability, and openness. And the project uh, you know, asks you how to form a unique relationship to it. And what was really interesting to see uh, for us, you, know, you kind of put something out in the world and then see how people respond to it, was that um, adults who used it that typically stayed on the exterior of the, the form uh, felt very vulnerable climbing this thing. And that act of feeling vulnerable uh, made them laugh at themselves and it made them more comfortable talking to other people around them. And we thought that was a very kind of powerful moment where, uh, you know, in that moment where you're confronted with falling through a structure, everyone is able to talk to each other um, and, and with strangers. So here, control is really exerted on the production of a form that enables numerous forms of engagement with the human body. Uh, the subject here is framed, but not limited. The second category of projects, and, and you'll notice I'm just showing a couple slides of other projects and then focusing on one in more detail. Um, the second category falls into what I'm terming are the articulated surface. The flexibility of the generic surface has positioned it as the primary typology to organize various forms of temporal processes. The articulated surface tests how the time-based management of impermanent processes can more fully choreograph difference, expression, identity, 
and the scale of human uses and or the transforming environment, reducing the abstraction between the subject and their larger context. So uh, this project was a response to the widespread impact felt on Long Island and other areas surrounding New York from Hurricane Sandy. It's actually quite a large uh, urban design uh, proposal for 1,500 new houses in Far Rockaway. Um, many of you have probably seen this in person. This is an image of Far Rockaway Boardwalk after uh, Sandy, which was destroyed with a series of protective sand dunes. And uh, new larger dooms were put in place as a, quote, temporary fix to the situation, essentially separating the city from the water and providing the impression that water is something dangerous and to be feared. And these barrier dunes have more or less transformed the beach into a piece of infrastructure in service of protection. Uh, the ramifications of the hurricane have the potential to further disconnect the site from the water through mechanisms of flood mitigation. For us, instead of perceiving this water as something to defend against, we really question how it can be repositioned as a performative feature that connects across uh, different aspects of the site. Uh, currently, for those of you who know Long Island, there's these series of these groins, essentially breakwaters, approximately 150 feet apart to stabilize the land. And we asked, what if these were increased in size to allow the water in while still being protective? So taking the logic of the stabilizing rock jetties, this proposal utilizes a series of figures to augment the existing coastline to allow the water into the development, alleviating its pressure and stabilizing the island. A second set of figures carve into the land, um, into the coast to create connections between these disconnected layers and allow the water into the site yet controlling it. Each of these sets of figures coincide with measured storm heights, creating really a didactic legibility of the site's water level. Further, each set of figures provides different programmatic opportunities related to its form when it is revealed. So this is a, a plan of it. And I'm really just focusing on the public zones, which are the figures. There's a, a field of housing also in the project, um, which is the 1,500 units of housing. Uh, for us, this coastline, this new reinvented coastline, instead of a static and separated line, is reconceived as an accommodating landscape, activated by these different levels of water, which in site programs calibrate it to seasonal and daily cycles. While some of these figures are clearly articulated, others accumulate passively over time, such as, for instance, the circular, does this show up here? Uh, not really. Uh, such as the circular cove, which would naturally form from the insertion of these breakwaters. So again, there's a play here between uh, setting up instruments in the water and allowing time to passively accumulate or carve sediment. Um, it's important to note that the surface here is positioned as this transforming uh, terrain that accommodates a diverse series of uses throughout the day, week, and season, depending on the tidal cycles and storm cycles. And so really here, there's an overlap between natural and human uses, which is managed and choreographed by the surface itself. And, and you know, more importantly, probably uh, adds, by adding these kind of figures, you get a legibility of the water levels or you know, the level between these water levels, which for us is a political act of engaging one in larger environmental systems. So the third approach we've examined is uh, what a, we've titled rewiring states. Rewiring states inserts architectural form in precise relationship to various states of time, temperature, materiality, and form, as well as processes, logistical, industrial, and infrastructural. These projects attempt to rewire these processes through leveraging how architecture can adapt, transform, and impact territorial organizations and add new socio-political actors to these systems. So the project I'll show here uh, was a competition proposal for dealing with sediment management in Toledo, Ohio. Um, is anyone from Toledo, Ohio? Oh, okay, um, just curious. So this is an image of just outside Toledo. Um, for those of you that don't know Toledo or the surrounding geography very well, uh, Toledo um, and this Great Lakes system actually produced three million cubic yards of uh, dredge material each year. And with increasing ship size, decreasing water levels, and serious deficiencies in upland sediment management, this dredging operation is likely to continue indefinitely. So uh, out of that three million cubic um, yards I talked about, it's fascinating to note that one third of that comes from Toledo and the Maumee Bay, uh, just next to Toledo. Uh, mostly because of its shallow depth and the amount of um, operations in its port. 
Uh, Toledo currently ranks seventh in the Great Lakes in total tonnage in terms of its port, uh, moving approximately 11 million tons of cargo annually. So this competition was set up to look at three things, what to do with this dredge material and ask how it can do more for the city, to reconsider stormwater management of the city, and find ways to cohabit the riverfront with regional industry and public programming. Um, one of the first things that's noticeable, uh, which you can see on the map on the left, is that dredge material is currently tugged out of the city and dumped into Lake Erie. This disconnection between the downtown core of the city and the new land of the dredge makes this, and you know, the separation of space and, and you know, the amount of kind of, I think it's about uh, four mile separation, uh, really makes using this dredge as a public asset challenging. Secondly, it's impossible given just the sheer amount of this material to dump this in different parts of the river itself. So instead we looked at a, a process of dredge and dredge remediation which uses uh, geotubes. Again, this is not something we designed. We don't exert control on the design of this technology. It's something that's out there and generic and works quite well, but we've used it in a very different way. Uh, we fill these tubes with dredge and we've floated them onto the water to, pr pr to propose a series of temporary islands that could be in close proximity to the city. So the way this process works is that the dredge material is pumped into these tubes which are combined together to create a series of floating pontoons. During the dewatering stage, these pontoons are fitted with public platforms. So this is about a three month cycle where the water is dewatered from these tubes. This essentially allows the residents of the city to have access to the water in, in these intervals while dewatering is occurring below. Uh, these are some of the islands we envision, which are essentially made through a grouping of these modular rafts. Uh, the idea, however, is that really any island type or program can be accommodated by the users of the city, uh, depending on the time of year or the residents' wishes. These are iterative, um, and you know, in, in that way, they're very low stakes. You don't have to get it perfect. Uh, finally, once dewatering is complete, these geotubes are opened up and hydro seeded and planted for remediating the dredge material itself, creating a series of floating wetlands. Um, because of the amount of dredge, scheduling the dredge, dewatering, public programming, and planting is critical. As a new series of islands is dispatched every month, new programs can be accommodated for based on seasonal events. This inserts a bottom up tactical and iterative approach to forming public space within the geologics of the industrial system. So here you can see islands in closer proximity to the city where they can really be used as public amenities. So uh, really the kind of counter project to this is what we see in most cities, which is a continuous waterfront project. And, and that's actually, I think, what the competition organizers wanted. I think that's why they set this thing up. Um, but in fact, when you look at uh, the ownership of land in Toledo, it's highly industrial and a highly productive uh, industrial land, and which, has, which is still being used and there's no kind of plans to stop using it. So we don't really see that form of urbanism uh, actually being able to occur here. We think it's a bit of a pipe dream. Um, instead, we actually propose that through these industrial lands, small easements are formed which create access points to these islands, and these easements also act as stormwater collection systems, bringing stormwater to these floating wetlands to be remediated before dispelled into the river. So the other aspect of this project uh, was looking at uh, what to do with stormwater management. The city of Toledo has been mandated to reduce its combined sewer overflow events by the EPA, inciting new scale of stormwater management projects. We examined how a series of smaller distributed wetlands could address the issue instead of a centralized hard gray water infrastructure that is currently being proposed. So one of the issues with stormwater management, as many of you know, is the distance between where a raindrop falls and where it eventually ends up. Uh, reducing that distance, in fact, reduces the amount of contaminants that that raindrop is gonna gather along its route. For us, we actually looked at the number of foreclosed houses in this competition was 2014, and it's amazing if you add up the area of those front and backyards of those foreclosed houses, it equals about 85 acres of land, which is estimated to be the amount of land to remediate uh, the stormwater and really detain it so it can infiltrate more naturally back into the earth. 
Uh, so we actually uh, operationalized these kind of wading lands by using the remediated dredge in a form of sandbags to create curbs around these properties while they're waiting to be rebought or taken down uh, as a distributed way of dealing with a large problem. So this is one of the images of the uh, access tributaries. These are one of the easements that allow for connection back to these islands. This particular one is one of the larger ones. There's very there's two of these at this scale that are dealing with dredge and remediating dredge year long when the river is also frozen. Um, finally, one of the current issues of dumping this dredge material in Lake Erie is the creation of algae, which suppresses light penetration and is threatening the lake ecosystem. So you probably saw in that first image of Lake Erie, you're probably wondering what that green goo was spewing out of uh, Toledo. That's actually algae. And essentially, you know, the light that it's blocking is killing everything below it. Um, for us, we actually wanted to see how this dredge material, which is actually currently the problem and adding to the problem of algae, could be used as a solution. Um, so for us, once this sediment is remediated in this geotube and safe for open lake placement, the soil in the pontoons is mixed with the rare earth bentonite and water solution. And this solution actually acts as a natural sponge to suppress and absorb algae growth. So uh, essentially these sealed geotubes are tugged out into the bay where the slurry is distributed through the lake gradually to suppress and absorb algae growth. Over several years, this process is anticipated to return Lake Erie to its original nutrient composition. The empty geotune pontoons can either be reinserted into the dredge cycle or stored depending on the season. By inserting incremental materials into the geologics of dredge, territorial issues such as harmful algae blooms are addressed in an appropriate time scale, which can be iteratively calibrated to the specific ecologies of the lake. So the proposed geologics of dredge enable local environments and citizens as well as territorial transformations to co-evolve with and through the dredge cycle. The expansion of beneficial uses that move beyond sediment repurposing to engage how the system of dredging itself can be a resource to cities and their ecologies both locally and territorially as well as in an immediate and geologic time frame implicates new subjects into, once was, into what was once a top-down linear, linear and industrial system. In the context of mid-sized cities such as Toledo, where low land values, productive industry collide with uh, water and associated deprivity of public space are, uh, occur, a system of producing land in a malleable, temporal, and transformable uh, logic enables a symbiotic cohabitation of industry, culture, and ecology. This positions land not as a commodity to capture and hold, but rather as a temporal material state that is iteratively deployed and used by local constituents and then redistributed to a territorial ecology. Within this expanded geologics, culture, politics, economics, and ecology find synergetic opportunities that empower these new subjects to be agents into a top-down engineered system of capital. So finally, uh, the fourth category is what we're calling the living archive, and this is associated with an approach to experimental history. Uh, this category questions and critiques and formats permanent forms of historical readings by inserting the contemporary subject into the making of the archive. These inherently political projects address the tension between the permanent archive and the temporal subjective understandings of knowledge by reframing our perception of permanence and origin through new approaches to archetypal form, structure, heaviness, power, and stability. So this uh, final project I want to show is a proposal for a temporary garden installation. Uh, which was also our inspiration for the exhibition here. And this project looks at the uh, idea and issue of invasive species. Uh, the project is cited in Canada. Um, invasive species are essentially species that were introduced and now, you know, kind of take over certain ecologies. In Canada right now, there's about 486 invasive plant species. And many of these were introduced during the colonization period of the 1800s for ornamental purposes, essentially to create gardens. Ironically, it is the success of these plants in flourishing in these non-native environments that now makes them a threat. Simultaneously, several of these alien plants have resided in Canada longer than Canada's own formation in 1867, making them effectively more Canadian than Canada itself. Um, our proposal produces a living archive of 22 of the earliest invasive plant species brought to Canada that were intentionally introduced for their beauty. 
Organized within a tensile portico structure, uh, each of these species is allowed to hover behind a transparent veil, and the species are separated from the ground where they could pose a threat. As the festival continues throughout the summer, these plants will develop and their weight will essentially pull them closer to the earth, the tension of the flexible portico aligning with the tension of the approaching species. So that's, uh, this is just an image, uh, very simple elevation of what looks to be a very monumental form, but is more or less made through a transparent and dematerialized veil. And this is a, a view at the beginning of the festival where each of the species is calibrated to be the same weight and thus uh, produce the same tension on the overall structure. This balancing act of tension is negotiated uh, with each individual unit acting on the whole as the entire structural system is created from interconnected tensile members. The structure is distorted by both the plants as well as human occupation, pushing and pulling on the modules by users, balancing environmental and social transformations. This is a planting plan uh, with the sort of worm's eye view that essentially ranges these species as a timeline along the portico. And essentially, you know, the scheme is trying to produce this interactive installation that attempts to merge art with ecology and politics. Um, through the structure itself, you can learn more about the qualities of these species through their soil and water retention, how fast they're growing and so forth. Um, but essentially, we're, what we're trying to do here is frame the tension between invasive and natives, which makes it a part art critique of culture as well as part garden critique of nature. And in a larger way, um, is a bit of a critique on you know, questions of xenophobia and immigration that we're all confronting today. So presented in the gallery, um, just here is a series of taxonomy drawings relating to each of these techniques, which we see as being the first uh, chapter in our office's development. Thank you. <laughs>